and then we'll get started. But if you want, you can go ahead and share your screen for now. Perfect. All right, uh, everyone, welcome to the uh, first session for today uh, in Electroweak Physics and Beyond the Standard Model. Uh, before we get started with this talk, I just wanted to uh, make one quick announcement, which is that the third talk for this uh, session has been canceled. The talk by uh, Marcus uh, Rorkin has been canceled. Uh, and that is a talk from 836 to 851. So what we will do in this session is uh, rather than mess up the times and rearrange things, we will just have a break uh, or extended discussion if people wanna stick around uh, from 836 to 851. And then we will resume at 854 with uh, Ben Yan's talk on charged lepton flavor violation. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started uh, for today. Our first talk is by Richard Ruiz, and he's going to tell us about event-dependent jet vetoes. Take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Sun. You can hear me all right, yes? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I accidentally muted myself like five minutes ago, so I wanted to make sure I'm still around. Uh, uh, Richard, can I just say, uh, it is a little hard to hear you, in fact. It is, a, if it's a little hard to hear me, let me try to find the... Um, I would turn the gain up on your microphone. Oh, uh, Joe, it's always a pleasure to see you and hear you. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I always complain. No worries, we have time. Um, I guess, how yes. I, how do I see the Zoom uh, audio? Hold on, let me uh, stop sharing really quickly so I can try to increase the volume. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we could live with it, I guess, but. Now I got a new computer not so long ago and uh, how's that, is that better? Yeah, baby, <laughs> why don't you go forward and we'll. All right. I think it's okay. Yeah, unfortunately I, it's, uh, it's my microphone. It's, uh, it's not really a uh, Zoom friendly. But if, uh, if you need me to uh, repeat myself, please just uh, ask away. And uh, Joe, be sure to give my regards to everyone in Pittsburgh. Hey. Yes, I um, that. Okay, without any further ado, um, thank you for the invitation and thank you for that introduction. Um, okay, so I have a lot to talk about or a lot to fit in. And just because I like want to tell a story, um, don't have so much time. So I'll give you start with the picture. And what would it be really helpful is if everyone just imagined what a high, imagine in your head, you know, a high PT LHC collision, you know, what does it look like to you? You know, here, here's an example of a Atlas event display, which actually Joe and company uh, put together themselves, um, showing, you know, a dye boson or maybe even a VBF process. And what the point I'm trying to make here is that if you start thinking about what do high PT events look like at the LHC, you know, you, there, there's lots of color going on. You, you have, of course, the forward jets and the beam remnant and the, this, uh, the, this underlying event that you get by the separation of the leading parton from the rest of the beam remnant. But you also have central color flow, you know, and if you if you have, for example, a dye boson, WZ production, for example, you know, you're annihilating a quark and an anti-quark from two different protons, and therefore you do have a color dipole, color, some kind of color flow that's being exchanged between the two protons. And this all gives rise to a concophony, just a huge amount, an avalanche of uh, hadronic activity at the, the, at the uh, detector level. Uh, specifically, you get central energetic activity, but this isn't everything. I mean, it, while the existence of this radiation is universal, the pattern isn't. And there are very special processes like vector boson scattering and the whole pantheon of uh, processes you can do that have an absence of color flow. You know, if you consider vector boson scattering, for example, at leading order, there is no color flow between the scattering vector bosons in the hard process. And so this leads to an absence of central color flow and hence an absence of central high PT jets. In the literature, this is known by the name of uh, rapidity gaps. And it's actually rather uh, important and, and uh, useful because this is telling you that if you were to see an event and there's a jet above a certain PT, say 30, uh, 25, 30 GeV within the central region 
of the detector, you know that's more background-like than signal-like, and so you would reject that event. Uh, central jet vetoes, these are crucial for Higgs physics and electric precision studies. And what was remarkable is that, you know, during run one of data taking, you know, there were major discrepancies. There were growing discrepancies with uh, standard model predictions, and this inspired a whole revolution in how jet vetoes are studied and uh, calculated. And I won't really go into that because I don't have time for that, invite me for a seminar. Uh, what I do want to say is that when it came to run uh, two data and uh, you know the upcoming run three, you know we can expect it as well. You know all of these past discrepancies that we saw in run one were resolved at the end of the day by uh, resumming the low PT. Can you still hear him? Uh, no, it looks like we have lost him. I was just wondering for a second if it was my computer. Uh, let me send him a message. Uh, I guess I'll send a message to everyone here. Uh, Richard, your... Oh. oh, I guess he just left the call. <laughs> Um, let's see. Uh, I guess I'll try to send him an email real quick. Um, although I assume he knows that he has, hopefully he's not talking to himself. <laughs> um, Oh, okay. It looks like he's back. Hi. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Welcome back. <laughs> yeah. My internet just kind of, uh, I'm not sure if that was me or anyone else, probably just me. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so shall I uh, try to share again? Uh, yes, go ahead. If you want, uh, maybe uh, turn your camera off if there's a bandwidth issue. Okay, um, where did you guys lose me? I'm sorry about that. I think if you started at the beginning of this slide, it would be good. Great, okay. Um, long story short, there's a lot of things that a lot of cool people did, including uh, experimentalists and theorists. And all of the discrepancies that were seen in run one uh, disappeared. And it was a mixture of just uh, fluctuations and, uh, and just needing better uh, understanding of QCD. So, what I, the, the whole little bit of motivation was a sort of an introduction to say that, uh, to try to establish that jet vetoes are mature technique. We have great control, great theoretical control and great understanding of the uncertainties. And so because of this maturity, you know, a few of us thought, well, why don't we apply jet vetoes to new physics searches? And just as a case study, you know, uh, you know we considered uh, heavy neutrinos. You can do this for sleptons, you can do this for uh, you know, BSM Higgses, but we focused on heavy neutrinos uh, for a particular reason, but you know, that's, uh, that's another story altogether. And you know this talk isn't about heavy neutrinos. You know there are reviews available, but what I do want to say is that you can make a heavy neutrino at the LHC in a number of ways, and particularly you can through do a charge current draw you into a heavy neutrino and decays leptonically. So this is kind of a prototypical example of a BS. M physics, you know, you're searching for charged lepton flavor violation because you've seen it elsewhere. You want to look for anomalous production of uh, multiple muons or multiple leptons, and you 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 have a draw on topology, so you have good and nice uh, a good clean process, and you have good theoretical control. And you know, if you threw this into the machinery, you know, if you wanted to actually look for this thing, you would look for say three leptons uh, in the inclusive search, and so we did that. We we 
did the, the signal process at next to leading order. We considered the TTW background. We considered the TRIW background, the DIE boson background. And what I'm plotting here is the, uh, the normalized uh, PT distribution of the leading jet. So unsurprisingly, you see that the leading jet from a top quark process is quite energetic on the order of, uh, on the order of MT. Uh, but for the, the, the charge current draw and the, the, um, this is the, the signal process at 150 GV or 450 GV, you know, that and the diboson, on the tribos on, you realize that there's only a signal separation between, uh, according to the born color structure, you know, you can't really separate the diboson boson or tribos on processes from the signal process. And so, you know, but okay, you know, you, you decide nonetheless to apply a jet veto. But uh, if you look, you see that in the leading jets, you know, there is quite a bit of bleed over. You know, if you have a heavy neutrino or W prime or slept on pair production, you are going to get high PT jets. It kind of just comes with the game because you're dealing with proton collisions and there is inevitably going to be color flow in proton collisions. But nonetheless, you know, if you try to apply a PT cut, you realize you are really biting into your signal process and you realize, you know, here I'm showing the, uh, the, the jet veto efficiency. So what's the cross fraction or cross section that survives the jet veto cut? You realize it's kind of terrible. You know, the, the survival, the signal survival crashes as you increase mass. Uh, the heavy neutrino masses. And so you just start thinking, well, maybe jet vetoes aren't useful for high mass BSM. You know, is it even useful? And so we haven't hawed about this for quite a while because, you know, intuitively you, you, you think about a heavy neutrino process, you know, just to go back a few, dire, a few pages, you know, this is a totally color singlet process. And you just naively think, well, since it's a color singlet process, you, there should be a way to cut on the amount of hadronic activity because this event looks totally different from a talk work event. And it kind of just clicked one day uh, when, uh, when I was at Fremont and just we decided, you know, it was kind of a silly idea, but it was a silly idea that surprisingly actually kind of worked. And this came to the idea of uh, event-based jet vetoes. And uh, we're not the first people to deal with this by no means. You know, it goes by uh, several names, dynamic jet veto, face-based dependent jet veto, which I think is uh, the clearest, um, or safe jet veto, as you'll see why. And the idea is this, you know, on an event-by-event -event basis, allow the kinematics of the of the, the collision process, the hard process, define the jet veto uh, threshold itself. Now, what do I mean by that? Is that you know you you have an event and with with a bunch of leptons, and as a you know and if the leptons are satisfy one kind of kinematic criteria, you know you you reject the event, and if the leptons satisfy another kinematic criteria, you 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 keep the event. And so ultimately, uh, uh, you're you're playing off the leptons and uh, just of the PT. Uh, PT of the jets, but you know, I'll give an example at the, uh, in just a moment. So what's the rationale for this? And the rationale for this is if you think about say the heavy neutrino uh, production or any other high PT process or any other BSM process that decays to leptons, you're looking for high PT leptons and the, the, the lepton PT or the invariant mass of all the leptons or the ST, this is typically gonna go like the hard scale of the, uh, of the process itself. Unlike all the, the initial state radiation in the process, you know, uh, the heavy neutrino production will have ISR uh, in association, but the PT for those jets are going to go like the Sudikov shoulder. And innately, this is at a much, much lower scale than the, uh, than the hard scale itself. In other words, the typical leading lepton in a heavy neutrino event is going to be much, much more energetic than the PT of the leading jet. And so the idea was this. On event by event basis, set the threshold, the, the jet veto threshold to be the equal to the leading lepton PT. So what do I mean by that? Suppose I had an LHC collision and I had a 30 and I, I had five leptons, but the leading lepton was 50 GV. Then if there's a jet in that event with the PT above 50 GV, reject it. If not, keep it. You know, and so for signal processes, you know, in which you're going to get TEV scale leptons, there are only going to be so few events with a jet that's also such with such energy. Most of the time it's going to be soft. So for Drow Yan and BBS type processes, these events are going to pass by construction. 
at a more technical level, because you no longer have a separation of skill between your jet veto uh, scale and your hard scale, you don't get large logarithms. So you actually have a lot of theoretical control innately, or at least a smaller uncertainty. The, uh, the example for uh, background processes and how does this affect background processes, I think my favorite one is a top quark. Because if you uh, take, take for example a TTZ event you know you have multiple leptons you have a couple B jets and net and uh, I just picked this uh, atlas event because it was a kind of a textbook kinematics you know you had invariant mass of a dilepton pair right on top of the z pole classic uh, met that went like a mw over 2 uh, coming from a top 2w to uh, uh, to lepton decay and if you look at the pts of these events typically you're going to get Lepton PTs that are on the order of 45, 50 GeV. But if you looked at the leading jets, which are probably going to come from B jets, these are at 60 GeV. So just by kinematics alone, you know, if you ask just naively for all, if you rejected events in which the leading jet was more energetic than the leading lepton, you would actually be able to reject this TTZ event without ever having B tagged. And that alone is kind of cool. Uh, the tri boson and di boson backgrounds can be reduced um, uh, similarly. It's uh, again, it's for technical, it's for kinematic reasons, but it's uh, but it takes more than a minute to explain. I have those slides in the backup, and so we had this idea, and so you know we decided you know again you know to plot the PT of the leading jet, and so here just you know I just uh, uh, copy and pasted this slide uh, to to remind everyone what uh, the leading uh, Ruiz, just to uh, interrupt uh, real quick uh, you have about uh, uh, two minutes technically but I think we'll start the next talk at about 8 20 two minutes later so you have about four minutes just two minutes is fine okay. um sorry again for uh, for the technical issues anyway so uh, again now I'm just showing this plot it's just uh, the PT distribution plot uh, that I showed a few slides ago to just to uh, remind everyone the sort of separation power you had. You know, you could only really separate the signal uh, from the top quark background. You know, this is as a function of PT, but if instead you consider the ratio of the leading lepton over the, uh, uh, the leading jet PT, you see that there's a much broader range of uh, separation, much stronger separation power. You know, rejecting events in which the leading jet is more energetic than the leading lepton would be essentially applying a cut of uh, this ratio of one. So you would accept things that are greater than one and reject things that are less than one. And you see it just, you know, it, it's eye popping that all of a sudden you went from having no separation of, or very poor separation between signal and background, you see much stronger separation between the background processes, which have a lot of uh, jet activity despite being color singlet processes and the signal process. So, you know, as a proof of principle, we took a CMS analysis back from uh, 2018, and we, and this was just a three lepton plus met analysis, and we reproduced the results, and that's the, uh, the blue one. The CMS results are this uh, orange line. And we ramped it up by three, three inverse out of barn, and, you know, at the end of the day, this is what the uh, CMS experiment would get completely redesigning the analysis and really being careful about backgrounds and trying to throw everything at it, we're able to show that, you know, using these sort of dynamic jet veto techniques, we're able to increase signal rates, decrease background rates, and really get good control still over the uh, theoretical uncertainty, improving things by a factor of 10. So in summary, lots of stuff. At the end of the day, uh, we have some kind of cool results, and I just will refer to you uh, to the... Uh, uh, to the papers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, are there any questions? Feel free to either speak up or I think speaking up is easiest. Okay, or, then uh, could I ask, uh, you started out by talking about rapidity gaps. Are these observations limited to events with rapidity gaps or just worked out a little bit more in that case? Do you think uh, for other signals, it could be other types of signals. This could also be uh, worth investigating. Uh, hi, Joe. Uh, that is a great question. Yes, I started off with rapidity gaps, more to uh, to make the physics clearer, to kind of uh, illustrate the point more. This works in my experience so far for draw yan and VBF, uh, draw yan and ve uh, vector boson scattering like processes. 
if you have a high PT, you know, uh, um, super massive colorless final state that it will work for that. So if you did gluon fusion to heavy Higgs to leptons, it will work. Um, it, but it won't work for say, uh, Clusacline, uh, Z prime going to top uh, TT bar, for example. Um, so if you have a colorless process decaying to leptons, it will work. Um, that's a very strong statement and uh, there are some caveats, but Trojan, gluon fusion, and uh, VBF, it works. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, uh, I think in the interest of time, uh, let's go ahead and get started with the next talk. Uh, I will uh, again remind people that uh, our talk uh, at 8.36 has been canceled. So uh, if you all want to continue further discussion, there's a between 8.36 and 8.51, uh, there's a basically a session break. So you're free to come and chat during that time if you want. Uh, Joseph, do you wanna go ahead and share your screen? Hi there, can you hear me all right? Uh, yes. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Joey Carter uh, from Atlas and he will tell us about uh, Higgs-like or dye boson resonances at Atlas. Hey, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I'll be giving a brief overview of, of some of the more recent results in these in these searches. Um, but first, maybe a bit of motivation for, for why we do these searches. Um, measurements of the Higgs boson at the Large Hadron Collider have so far shown excellent agreement with the standard model predictions. So for example, measurements of production cross-sections and branching ratios, and the example I put here on the right, uh, couplings to vector bosons and fermions. But of course, we know that the standard model is not the ultimate theory of nature and has many well-known and well, many well-documented shortcomings, and just to name a few, so no explanation of gravity, matter-antimatter asymmetries, no dark matter candidates, uh, neutrinos, neutrino masses, the hierarchy problem, and, and questions of Higgs mass naturalness. So of course, uh, this motivates some extensions to the standard model, and some of these extensions predict additional Higgs bosons. So for example, you have the two Higgs doublet models, uh, two HDM, which predict five Higgs bosons. And if you're familiar with the minimal supersymmetric standard model, of course, this is, this is one such two HDM model. Um, so next, an overview of the ATLAS Higgs-like search program. So of course, ATLAS is an experiment at the LHC. We collected 139 inverse femtobarns of proton-proton collisions during run two of the LHC between 2015 and 2018. And all the analyses I'll be presenting here today now use the full run two data set. So the first part of the search program is indirect searches. So here what we do is precision measurements of standard model Higgs couplings, and then do reinterpretations in VSM extensions. Uh, another, for example, one thing you can do is you can do a search for dark matter and then do interpretations uh, in that search in models with extended Higgs sectors. Uh, next are the direct searches. So here you can do searches for additional neutral Higgs bosons directly and other heavy diboson resonances. You can also do searches for singly and doubly charged Higgs bosons, which will come up later. Uh, and then you can also do searches for resonant dye Higgs production. Uh, so these, these direct searches are what I'll be focusing on today. And most of the analyses I present here today are improvements on previous analyses. The main one, of course, being with increased luminosity of a larger data set. Uh, so it's less, uh, a little bit more statistics, of course. Um, also, most analyses use improved object reconstruction isolation so you can improve the mass resolution. Uh, and then also the use of many multivariate analysis techniques, such as neural networks. Uh, so the first analysis I'll be going over is a search for heavy ZZ resonances. Uh, so here we search in the four lepton and the two lepton two neutrino channels. Uh, the benefit, we get the benefit from the mass resolution of the four lepton channel, and then the two L2 new channel gets a larger branching ratio. So these are improvements on a previous analysis. Uh, mainly with improved lepton reconstruction and isolation, use of particle flow jets, improved event selection in the two lepton nu two neutrino channel, and as well as the use of a neural network for event classification in the four lepton channel. So first we'll go over the, the four lepton channel. So here we select two same flavor opposite sign lepton pairs, where lepton we say is an electron or a muon. The main background in this search is non-resonant ZZ production, which accounts for roughly 97% of the expected number of events. So the shape of this background is modeled by an empirical function fit to simulation. 
and the normalization of which is allowed to vary freely in the final fit to the data. So the event categorization, like I said, is done by a neural network. And in fact, it's done by two separate neural networks. So one to classify GGF enriched events and uh, one for VBF like events. Uh, so in total, we get five event categories, depending, depending on the lepton flavor and the neural network scores. And this is this is what the plot on the upper right shows. So this is the, the VBF neural net score uh, for the different uh, background and signal processes. And the plot on the lower right shows uh, uh, the category, the GGF enriched category with the, the four lepton invariant mass distribution and overall is a very good agreement between predictions and, and data. Uh, so next is the two lepton to neutrino channel. So in this case, we select one same flavor opposite sign lepton pair plus uh, high uh, uh, missing transverse energy. And one of the requirements is, uh, is this so-called ETMS significance. So we require a high ETMS significance. We also require ETMS to be back-to-back -back with the lepton pair, which ensures that it's, it's coming from a, <laughs> from a Higgs-like decay. Um, the dominant backgrounds for the search are from ZZ and WZ production. Uh, so the ZZ uh, is directly from simulation, and but but like the four lepton channel, the normalization is allowed to float in the in the fit to data. Uh, and the WZ background is estimated using a data driven method in a three lepton control region. So for this search, the full invariant mass cannot be reconstructed. So that means we have to use the transverse mass as the discriminating variable, and it's defined right here. The Cut the uh, categorization is done using a cut based approach uh, for classifying GGF like and VBF like events, and that we place a cut on the on the DiJet system. Okay, so when we combine the two results from the two channels, we see no significant excesses. Uh, so therefore, we set upper limits on the cross section times branching ratio. Uh, for narrow width signals, uh, we do fits for GGF and VBF processes separately. Uh, do this to remain model independent. So in, in a sense, we assume no relative protection rate between the two. Uh, we also have results for large width signals. Uh, and here we, uh, we include interference effects between things like heavy and light Higgs, Higgs and GG, ZZ. Um, and these results are shown in the backup. We also have interpretations in two HGM models and for a RS graviton, which are also included in the backup. Uh, so the plots on the left show the exclusion limits uh, uh, the largest uh, excess we observe are at 240 GB in the GGF channel and at 660 GB in the VBF uh, production mode. And the upper limits are shown in this box right here. All right, next we come to searches for heavy and gamma res resonances. Uh, so here, this is similar to the, to the ZZ resonances just in the, in the diphoton final state. Uh, so here we search again for spin zero and spin two resonances. Uh, we select events with two isolated photons within the acceptance of the electromagnetic calorimeter. Uh, the signal model we consider is the truth line shape, which is modeled as a relativistic bright Wigner, uh, convoluted with the detector resolution, which is modeled as a double-sided crystal ball. The background model that we use for this is a, is a template function built from simulated gamma gamma events. And there's also uh, estimated from a data control region for gamma plus jet events. Uh, the plot on the right shows the background and the, and the uh, data, and it shows generally good agreement between the two over the full mass range, which means we see no significant excesses like before. Uh, the largest excess we saw was at 684 GV. Uh, with a local significance of 3.29 sigma, 1.3 global. Uh, we set up our limits on the fiducial cross section for the spin zero case and the total cross section for the graviton case, which is shown in the backup. And this is what the plots on the bottom show. So it sh shows the lo local significance in the width and mass plane, and then the, uh, the exclusion or, or the, the CLS limits uh, as a function of mass here, which are, which are shown again in this box on the right. All right, next I come to a search for a pseudoscalar A, CP odds, uh, Higgs boson A decaying to a Z and, a, and a, uh, another heavy Higgs boson H. So we consider three channels in this search, all with the Z boson going to a lepton pair. Uh, so the first is uh, with the heavy Higgs boson going to BB bar. Uh, so there we consider two production modes, GGF like, uh, which is shown in the final diagram on the left. And then a BBA like where, where the A is produced in association with two P quarks, which is shown in the Feynman diagram in the middle. 
And the next one, which is in fact if the first search of it is kind of the LHC, is where the heavy Higgs goes to uh, two W, two Ws, and where each of the W goes to a, a quark anti quark pair. So first we'll go over the uh, LLBB bar final state. Uh, so here we categorize production mechanisms according to the BJ multiplicity. So we say it's GGF-like if it has two B quarks. Uh, in this case, we select events with an invariant BB mass uh, in this range here. Uh, for BBA-like, we say uh, we select events with uh, greater than or equal to three B jets, and then we use a slightly larger uh, MBB window to account for the, the poor mass resolution in this channel. So the dominant backgrounds are, 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 are uh, excuse me, from Z plus jets. The normalization is taken from a data-driven approach in control regions defined by inverting this, this uh, MBB window uh, shown above, and it's done for each uh, heavy Higgs boson mass hypothesis. So again, the plots on the right show, so, show a few invariant mass distributions, and they show generally good agreement between data and background predictions. And then the plots on the bottom uh, show the upper limits as a function of the heavy Higgs and the heavy uh, CP even Higgs A. All right, next to so come to the LLWW final state. So here we construct a four jet system from the five highest PT jets according to the kinematic variable cuts, uh, which optimize signal efficiency and background rejection. So similar to the, the channel I showed before, select events with a 4Q invariant mass in this mass window here. Uh, in this case, the dominant background is again from Z plus jets, but accounts for a bit more of the expected number of events. And the normalization of which is, is taken from a similar method by inverting this M4Q window uh, shown here and, and define a, a control region from that. Again, in this channel, you see very good agreement between background predictions and, and data. And in fact, no significant excesses were observed in either, in either channel. Uh, the largest excesses are shown here in, at the MAMH points. Uh, their local significance is shown in this column here, and then the upper limits are uh, shown here. So it's a, they vary with, with mass, of course. All right, next I come to a search for a charged Higgs boson decaying to a top and bottom quark. Uh, so this is motivated with uh, two HDM models with where the coast of the beta minus alpha parameter is roughly zero. So in this case, the dominant decay is uh, H to TB for masses greater than 200 GeV. So again, this, this improves upon a previous search, um, mainly with the use of simulated, uh, with a simultaneous fit to the multivariate analysis classifier outputs. And this uh, helps determine signal contribution and background normalization. So in this case, we split <clears throat> into categories with different jet and B jet multiplicities. So you can say five jets plus three or greater than or equal to four B jets, and then greater than six jets uh, plus three or greater than four B jets. So we're here, <clears throat> excuse me, here a simulation-based modeling of the top quark background does not give very good agreement with data. So what we do to account for this is apply a re-weighting procedure. And this is based on jet multiplicity and the HG distributions. Uh, the neural network is trained on parameters related to jet and lepton kinematics. So you have, for example, jet PT, scalar sum of the PT of all the jets, uh, jet and lepton centrality, and so on, um, as well as a so-called kinematic discriminant, which is which itself is an MBA. And this this is one of the one of the variables that in fact gives the best discrimination power. And and this is an example of the neural network output score uh, for the different background and signal processes. So we saw no significant excesses in the search. So, so therefore, of course, we set upper limits on the cross-section times branching ratio. This is what the plot on the lower left shows. Uh, we've also done interpretations in the uh, MSSM, or excuse me, HMSSM <laughs> scenarios, and a few different benchmark cases uh, that consider the MH125, um, which and more of those are shown in the back of. And the upper limits that we that we see are, are shown in this box here. Uh, the range of our mass. All right, finally, I come to a search for a doubly charged Higgs boson. Uh, so, so searches in this for, for such doubly charged Higgs bosons are motivated uh, by models which account for neutrino masses, such as the type two seesaw mechanism. So this again was an improvement on a previous search. Uh, 
here we include the production of a doubly charged Higgs boson in association with a singly charged Higgs boson, which is what this the Feynman diagram on, on the right uh, shows. Uh, so of course we consider two scenarios here, which are, which are each one illustrated by the Feynman diagram. Uh, in both cases, we take the triplet vacuum expectation value VT is 100 MeV. And this ensures that the only possible decay is to of the doubly charged Higgs boson is to WW. Uh, we only consider for the singly charged Higgs boson case, we only consider uh, to it decaying to W plus Z. Uh, depending on the, the mass of the charged Higgs boson, the branching ratio varies between 40 and 60%. Mm -hmm. um, but the contribution from other possible decays was found to be negligible in a study of simulation data. Right. Uh, so in this search, we, we categorize things based on the total sum of charge of the leptons in the event. So and then we then we make three different categories: so two same charge leptons, three leptons, and, and four leptons. Uh, the dominant backgrounds here, depending on the channel, are mostly from WZ production as well as ZZ and WW. Uh, some small backgrounds from non-prompt leptons, TTW and TTZ. Uh, many of these production or many of these backgrounds use data-driven methods. Uh, with dedicated control regions. So for example, the WZ and non-prompt backgrounds. Overall, we see good agreement between data and background predictions. So no significant excesses were observed here as well. Um, and if, as you can probably guess by now, that means we set up the limits on, on cross-section times branch ratio, which are shown as a function of mass and these plots on the right. All right, so, so in the most recent set of analyses and searches, we see no significant excesses over standard model predictions. But of course, we still have an active uh, search program at Atlas. Uh, we've made a substantial update on constraints to two HDM models and other BSM models. Uh, so one example of we, if you can combine these, these results in the MSSM framework, then you can get something that looks like this. Uh, so it shows you know, good results overall. And, but of course, only a small subset of results have been shown today. There's still many exciting new regions of phase space to probe using the full run two, as well as the run three data set, in fact. And I've, I've omitted a, a search for a Di Higgs production, a resonant Di Higgs production, but there's much more information in, in an upcoming talk on Thursday. All right, thanks. All right, thank you. Um... Are there any questions? Uh, like I said, the next talk uh, is actually canceled. So uh, if you have questions, feel free to stick around. Uh, Tanya, go ahead. Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, can you go to slide 10, I think? With the double W to four. Yeah, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. So oops. So your masses are in the table below. Uh, are the Ws very boosted or not? I mean, is there some problem with this that you have very highly boosted Ws um, in this project final state, or is it not a problem? I don't think it's a problem if, if I recall correctly. Mm. Um, maybe in a, few, in a few events they're highly boosted, but I think overall they, it was sort of normal kinematics. <laughs> mm, okay, I mean, the masses are not so high, right? I guess if you would go to higher masses, maybe there would be some discussion. That's right, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Is everyone still there? <laughs> oh, sorry. I was uh, I was speaking while muted. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I had a question. Uh, uh, you had mentioned that you have uh, in this analysis improved uh, uh, object reconstruction and isolation. Uh, what was uh, done differently compared to previous analysis, and and by how much? Like, is there a way you can't quantify how much you've improved it? Oh, about how much we've improved it. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think, I, well, I think most of the, in, in a lot of the reconstruction that, that happens at Atlas, I think there, there's a big push to move towards sort of multivariate analysis techniques. Um, so things like B tagging and, and um, I, I can't recall exactly what was done in each case compared to previous ones. I think in overall, it probably gives a, an improvements of 
you know, maybe maybe a percent at most. I would have to, have to go back and look <laughs> to see exactly. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions from anyone? Uh, all right. Uh, if not, uh, like I said, the next talk is canceled. And so we will resume uh, again at 8.54 uh, with a talk on charged lepton flavor violation uh, by Binyan. So uh, you can either feel free to stick around or come back at 8.54.
Hi, Ben. Uh, do you want to go ahead and uh, share your screen? Uh, yeah. So just your title slide. I'll, we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Could you see my slide? Uh, yes, you can. Okay. Let me so I'll just wait till uh, 854 and then we'll. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, since it, it is 8.54, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so our next talk is by Ben Yan from Los Alamos, and he's going to tell us about uh, prospects for charged lepton flavor violation at the EIC. Hello, everyone. Uh, today I will talk about the charged lepton flavor violation at the EIC. This talk is based on this paper. We just published this issue just uh, last month. Uh, and uh, for the charge lepton preparation, uh, we have no, the, for the lepton preparation is not consoled. This, this is uh, from the data of the neutrino isolation. It means from the different flavor of neutrino could be translated to each yeah, other. For example, mu yi could be mu mu or mu tau. Uh, so this is a very important uh, observation. So it means that. In principle, we based on this uh, uh, data, we could, in principle we could also ca ca could induce some charge lepton fluorescence in the standard model, for example, through this diagram. But for this diagram, uh, the type pure branch ratio is we uh, highly suppressed by the neutral mass, typically roughly about the mu, mu over mw square. So this branch ratio is 10 to minus 44. It's very very small, so it is possible to uh, test at uh, uh, current or future uh, characters. But if there are some new phase, mod new phase models could induce some charge lepton preparation, for example, in here, you, maybe some new particles in the loop, then and this process uh, will sensitive to the new phase because the standard model is small. If we find any signal related to this diagram, it means that it should be from the new phase. And uh, the charge lepton preparation also correlated to the neutral mass. Um, so if we could give a precise me measurement of the charge lepton preparation, in principle, we can also get some information of the neutral mass, neutral mass. For example, many, many years ago, I proposed a model to explain the neutral mass, and it will also generate the charge lepton preparation signals. Uh, for the charge lepton preparation, uh, has been widely studied by many uh, experiments. For example, from well low and uh, low data from Baba or BL2, or to the lab, and also HERA, and also the Teratron and LC. And uh, in, in this talk, I will focus on tau lepton only because for the muon, muon the charge lepton comparison is based uh, 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 highly constrained by the noise data. But for the tau, the constraint is not very strong. so. In principle, so it's possible to be give some new information from the EIC. So here, I just show a uh, first global picture, so you can know what's the impact of the EIC. Uh, so the net gray here is from the EIC with the tau to decay to the muon channel, and then the blue is for the uh, is from HC, and the red is from the launch data. Uh, so you could find out uh, for, for here just to use some few uh, operators. You could find out uh, the ESA is comparable to the RHC. And uh, of course, I uh, only show that the luminosity is 100 US bar. It's not very high, but uh, 
so you could find out uh, the limit is very strong for some operators. Of, of, for if uh, we include the hydronic decay, the, strong, the limit should be stronger. So this is hopeful to propose uh, to propose the charge lepton fluorescent effects at the ESC. So next, uh, I will give the detailed discussion of this project. So the tool of I use this uh, EFT assumes that the hex is uh, in this fundamental particle. So we can use the linear as the EFT to describe the possible new phase effects. The new phase effects could be described by, the by some high dimensional operators from the time six, times eight. Uh, and uh, there's a relation between the fourth area to the EFT you could, uh, could understand from this cartoon. In, in the high scale, uh, we have uh, heavy and also light particles in the Lagrangian, but in the low end, low, end, low end, we only have light particles. Therefore, we should integrate out the heavy particles and then do a running and matching at, at the low end scale. So after that, we can use the, the diamond six and diamond eight operators to uh, to describe any fixed effects. But for diamond eight operators, we will uh, suppress so, so compared to the six operators. So in this work, I will only focus on them six operators. Uh, in this work, I will give, uh, include uh, the general discussion of the charge electron fluoration. It means we include all possible uh, operators. For example, the, the vector and the actual currents and all the type of operators, the equal type of operators, and also four premium operators. Uh, here, just to show one of the exa example, include, for example, the vector and actual current, and also the type of operators. And for, for, for fermion operators, we, give, uh, we consider a general fluid structure, quark fluid structure. For example, here we include the DD, MDS, and DB, and also other components in fluid space. So this is our uh, um, operators already considered. So another imp really important uh, point in our project is that because we, we want to uh, com compare between the low end data and also high end data. But from when we know from the low end data, the typical scale is roughly about a few GeV, but for the highest uh, high energy of the boss, the typical scale is about TeV. So we should include the large edge running effects. And then in, in, in the, we also found that for some operators, uh, for example, uh, the, the heavy quark, uh, for the uh, heavy quark uh, uh, component, it will uh, uh, give, a give a contribution to some operators through the loop level. This is based on the operator mixing effects. So from, from, the, from this case, although the, the low-end data from the Baba or ESA cannot give a constraint for this uh, heavy quark component directly, but the operator mixing effects will give a strong constraint because the, for some low energy data, they could give a uh, strong constraint for some operators. So this is very, very important to include the edge running effects in order to give a constraint for some operators, especially for the uh, heavy quark component, or for example, quark component. For DS production, uh, 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 we have to include the general operation of the electron and proton. The cross section could be uh, include two parts. One is for the amplified cross section. That this is uh, you do uh, this, this is should be uh, familiar for everybody. And the second part is from the polarized cross section. It should depend on the polarization of polarization of the uh, of the proton. So in in general, it should include two parts. But if you find, but you could find that the polarized PDF is, is small compared to the unpolarized PDF. So the cross section from polarized part will are highly suppressed by PDF, and roughly about five ten, where you can find from these this figures for the polarized unpolarized case. So for the first estimation, so we just focus on the unpolarized unpolarized cross section. Uh, based on the tau uh, decay, we could have three channels with a tau decay to uh, electron, and tau decay to muon, and tau decay hydrons. And the typical background in this process is the standard model DS process. But for, for, for the electron and the hydrogen decay, the, the, the background is very large. 
So it would be changing to such the uh, such the configuration. Oh, sorry, uh, through through those two channels. But for the Mion channel, you will find after we require a large PT, you know, about the PT larger 10 G V, the background will hand suppressed. So for this, for the Mion channel, this process is background free. So this will, so it will be useful to constrain the charge life configuration through this process. Uh, so just uh, input some basic card from the PT and, and also the PT and some synergy to search the charge life configuration at the EIC. Uh, but after doing some simple analysis, you will get this card uh, efficiency tables. You will find the, 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 the main conclusion is that this card efficiency are sensitive to the craft flavor, uh, not, but not sensitive to the operation of tau. For example, in here, uh, which you for the left tau, right tau, the, the, the efficiency is roughly the same, but not too much. But for the, from the UU to CC, AD, and SSB, and then BB, the efficiency will change a lot because this is sensitive to the, the craft flavor. Because Mm, for the hair flavor, the typical PT is small. So if you have to include the card, PT card, you have uh, hand separate the, also separate the signal. So after uh, you know all the uh, card efficiency of uh, different operators, the next step, you can just uh, combine the cross-section and uh, to give a constraint for the charge left from flavors and operators. Uh, before I give a, a, a final conclusion, next I will discuss the other possible constraints. The first constraint is from the RC. Uh, because, uh, for example, the Z boson and the hex decay could also give a constraint for the uh, operators, which to the, the E tau and the hex E tau. And also, could from the top K and also maybe the high run gradient process. So, we also include all the uh, constraints from the RC. And also include the constraint from the uh, knowledge data. From the tau decay or B minus decay, uh, because of the, the tau lepton and the neutrino is adapted uh, under the SO2, so for some process uh, they are not related to tau deduction, but it was also could get constrained for the for this operators. For example, in here the pi on, or k on or d on decay to some neutrino to some neutrinos, we define this as uh, some indirect bands. So here, just the show, uh, typical uh, Feynman di diagram, uh, uh, how this operators will modify this um, tau decay or some uh, mass of decay. Uh, but for detail, I didn't, but for don't, the time, I don't discuss detail of this, of this, this diagram. So after we include all the constraints from the uh, RC and also from the the data and also the limit from the ESA, we come back to the this 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 figure as which I discussed this before. So for the dipole E carbon vector actual carbon, you know, we will find that ESA is comparable to the LC. This is this this is this is this conclusion is really exciting. So although the ESA is, is desired for the QCD, but it is also a very good machine to search some new fix. For example, in here, just check out the charge lepton flow relation. A second one, I show some uh, fermion uh, operators dimension. For this case, uh, we will find that the heavy car component will give the GSA will give a very strong constraint for the heavy car component. For example, the BD, BS, and BB, the limit from is comparable to HD and also comparable to the load data. Uh, but for the current analysis, we only focus on one operator at a time. So, but, uh, we, but we know for some new phase models, it will uh, induce more than one operator after we integrate all those new, uh, new hair particles. So we also test the, the impact after we include more than one operator. Um, here, I just uh, uh, use two scenarios because it's with different operators. Uh, you could find us from the from the known data, for example, the, the orange line is from the tau decay. It's, it's way different as the known data. 
uh, it could only constrain for some uh, uh, direction. For example, here is a, a diagonal direction, but it cannot cover constrain for the off diagonal direction. Uh, for, but for HC and also the EIC could go constrain. So, so the EIC and HC are very important to uh, get constrained for the uh, for, to give a global picture of the charge state configuration, and the expression for EIC. Uh, but of, of course, uh, this EIC is based on uh, one hundred units spent bar. So if we have more data, then it will be stronger. And similar for the similar B. We could find a similar, uh, similar conclusion. Yeah, I say the, the long data we are only con constrained for some direction, but yeah, I say it could uh, close another one. Okay, finally, I give a uh, summary. Uh, uh, firstly, the, the charge data comparison are very important to uh, nuclear signal because we could uh, find some uh, uh, connection between the neutrino mass and also the, the signal. Uh, secondly, the ISA is a good machine to propose uh, this charge life from the effects. And uh, finally, we, we found that the limit from the ISA is comparable uh, to the HC and also the B factories, and uh, also compared to the HC and also B factory. So it's very important uh, to uh, search the new phase signals through uh, EIC, and then also very important uh, to combine the different uh, measurement to give a global picture of the charge electron for Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Ben. Um, are there any uh, questions for the speaker? Feel free to either speak up or raise your hand. Um, uh, if there's no questions at the moment, uh, uh, let me go ahead and ask, uh, uh, I had a question. Um, on your uh, slide where you are comparing the, uh, uh, yeah, I guess this slide right here where you're comparing the uh, the EIC and the LHC limits. Uh, I had a couple of questions on this. One is that uh, in the, uh, the second uh, set of bars where you're looking at the, in the red, the low energy one where you're looking at the tau to E gamma, mm -hmm. uh, below that you have this, uh, effective coefficient gamma EZ, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, is it, I'm not clear on how you're constraining that through the tau to E gamma process. Is it through a loop process where you have uh, an insertion of a tau Z uh, E vertex and then uh, how do you get uh, a constraint uh, on tau EZ from tau to E gamma? Is it through a loop process or? Uh, to loop, uh, yeah. Oh, so I see. So it is a loop uh, level yeah, loop. process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. And then also, I'm not clear on uh, what is the y prime in the third column. Uh, this uh, you call a type of uh, uh, protest. Oh, um, I see. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, so anyone? Uh, let's see, I actually had one more question, which is, uh, uh, again, related to one of your uh, slides where you're showing the limits. I think it's on slide 16. Yeah. Uh, so in this very last column, uh, once again, you have, you're constraining CLQDBB, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't see any B quarks in tau to E pi pi. Mm, let's see. Is that a how do you constrain a four fermion operator with B quarks from tau to E pi pi? Uh, I think this is why maybe for really choose from the uh, Agiloni, but, but uh, I forgot the detail, sorry. It's because this part I don't know, this is this part. So, uh, but I think maybe related to the Agiloni, you know, because you know, the operator could be related to other one, the, the light flavor component through the mix from the, op from the operator mixing. Yeah. But I, I will check this, but I, I forgot. Okay. Detail. I wonder if it's just a typo or something, because you have the, uh, 
B quark channels before that to constrain coefficients that involve B quarks, and then mm. yeah. Anyway, yeah, all thank right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Thanks a lot. Uh, all right. Let's uh, move to the next talk, uh, which is. Uh, on leptoquarks uh, by uh, Sturgios, are you here? Yes, hello, can you hear Hi. me? Yeah. Uh, all right, so our next talk is going to be on searching for leptoquarks with the Atlas detector by Sturgios uh, Kazakos. Uh, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to give this talk. Uh, so I uh, will talk about searches for leptoquarks with the Atlas detector on behalf of the collaboration. And as a quick in introduction, so leptoquarks are hypothetical particles with a fractional electric charge that couple simultaneously to a lepton and a quark. Uh, there is a deeper motivation for them as they were originally predicted in grand unification theories like in SU5 unification models. Uh, but they also appear in other uh, beyond the standard model scenarios like RPV, SUSE, compositeness models, uh, etc. Uh, they are the most favorite uh, candidate to explain the B physics anomalies, uh, which point to potential uh, lepton flavor universality violation. Uh, these anomalies manifest both in charged and neutral current uh, processes, and they seem to persist uh, in the latest LHB measurement of uh, the RK ratio. Uh, with a deviation of uh, 3.1 uh, sigma from the standard model. And here you see the latest plot uh, from, the, uh, from the paper from the LHCB uh, on that. And the simplest explanations of these anomalies uh, involve either a single uh, vector leptoquark uh, denoted as U1 or two scalar uh, leptoquarks, uh, a singlet and a triplet uh, denoted as uh, S1 and S3 respectively. And uh, if uh, the leptoquarks are confirmed, uh, then uh, they will contribute with additional uh, three level diagrams, uh, as you see here uh, in the processes. Uh, so, in Atlas, we have a broad uh, physics program of uh, leptoquark searches uh, with different final states. Uh, uh, they are based on uh, the BRW model and uh, targeting uh, up or down type leptoquarks with different charges. And also leptoquark decays uh, in uh, first, second, or third generation uh, particles. Uh, the main uh, production modes for the leptoquarks uh, are uh, the pair production, uh, where the cross section is basically dominated by QCD and uh, it's mostly dependent uh, on the mass uh, in a resonant way. Uh, then there is the single production, where the, pro the cross section is uh, proportional to the lambda squared, where the lambda is the Kukukawa coupling of leptoquark uh, to quarks and leptons. And then we have the non-resonant production uh, where the cross-section is proportional to the lambda to the fourth. Uh, the current uh, focus of this talk will be on pair production of scalar leptoquarks. Uh, we are targeting leptoquark decays into flavor diagonal and cross-generational final states. Uh, but there are also searches ongoing uh, for other production modes apart from the pair production here. And uh, the vector leptoquark models, which I will not discuss, uh, will follow later uh, with a higher cross section, as you see, as you can see here uh, from this plot. And uh, basically, the covered signatures that I will show today depend on some uh, public results uh, uh, with uh, with analysis targeting a pair production of uh, scalar leptoquarks decaying to these following categories. And here, uh, the entries in the rows and columns uh, denote the quark uh, and the lepton of the dominant uh, decay mode. So from here, you see that we have several papers uh, either uh, published or submitted to JHEP or uh, EPJC. And uh, with, uh, with all these different uh, final states, uh, we have reinterpretations from SUSE analysis here in gray. And also, we have this uh, kind of note uh, from a flavor diagonal uh, analysis with beta equal uh, 0.5, uh, where uh, one of the leptoquarks uh, goes, uh, let's say, to be new, and the other one goes to uh, top tau or uh, vice versa. And uh, this beta is basically the branching fraction. Uh, is uh, let's say, the relative coupling between uh, the leptoquarks to, uh, to leptons and uh, to neutrinos that controls the branching, the branching fraction. 
Uh, so I will also draw some results from uh, a summary paper on third generation leptocorks. Uh, so let's begin. I will start with uh, uh, the analysis of leptocorks going to uh, quarks and uh, light leptons. Uh, this is the first analysis on cross-generational uh, levitocorrect decays uh, using dedicated uh, C and B jet uh, identification algorithms. And uh, we are not using any jet ID, ID for uh, the, uh, the UDS uh, channels. Uh, we call it a pre-tag. Uh, the region categorization is based on uh, this asymmetric mass, uh, which exploits uh, the minimum and maximum invariant mass between the lepton and the jet. And uh, based on that, uh, we define uh, either the sideband region, uh, as you see here, from uh, 0.2 to 0.4. And the control and signal regions are defined uh, uh, for uh, this asymmetric mass uh, less than 0.2. Uh, the average uh, reconstructed leptocarc mass is used as a uh, final discriminant. You see the formula here. And the main selection is basically to lepton opposite sign with at least uh, two jets. Uh, the main backgrounds, as you also see in the plots, uh, are from Drelian uh, and uh, TTBAR processes. And the normalizations are left uh, free floated uh, in the fit as a single parameter. Uh, other backgrounds are estimated from uh, Monte Carlo. And uh, the regions that are used in the fit, because we have uh, these three categories uh, for the QL channels. Uh, uh, Basically, for all the channels, we are fitting a combination of signal region, sideband region, and uh, top control region. Uh, but uh, in the QL channels, we are not using any uh, jet identification. In the CL channels, we are using both uh, BNC identification uh, for the jets. And uh, in the BL channels, we are using uh, only for the Bs. Uh, then the search range for this analysis is from 0.4 to 2 TV. Uh, we don't see any significant excess uh, over the standard model background in all of the six categories. And uh, the exclusion limit is set as a, as a function of uh, mass and branching ratio and branching fraction. So we have uh, exclusion of 1.8 TV for electrons and up to 1.7 TV for muons for beta equal one. And also for beta equal 0.1, we have an exclusion of uh, 0.8 TV. And uh, these results uh, basically improve the sensitivity by about uh, three to 400 GV in leptocarc mass compared to previous uh, uh, scalar leptocarc searches. And here you see uh, the three categories for electrons and muons. Uh, this is branching fraction versus leptocarc mass. And uh, at each point of uh, branching fraction, you see which mass uh, is excluded up to which mass. Uh, so moving on to another analysis, uh, down type uh, leptocorks to uh, top quarks and uh, light leptons, electrons or muons. Uh, this is targeting the hadronic decay channel in the boosted regime. So both uh, top quarks uh, go hadronically here. We have a two lepton opposite sign selection requiring at least uh, two larger jets uh, to select the boosted tops. And then the signal over background classification uh, is done using a gradient boosting uh, BDT approach. So we have a single uh, classifier optimized uh, for the wide range of uh, leptocarc masses in a mass parameterized way. And we use kinematic variables uh, as inputs uh, that are calculated in the rest frame of uh, intermediate particles like uh, leptocarc top uh, Z bosons. Uh, this doing uh, some jigsaw reconstruction. And we are also using jet, uh, jet substructure variables uh, as inputs, but only for the muon channel. Uh, the two main backgrounds uh, uh, are the G plus jets and the TT bar production, uh, which are estimated from Monte Carlo with the normalization uh, constrained uh, by dedicated uh, control regions. And then the background composition in the signal regions for electrons or muons are given by this uh, chart here, so that you can have a look. And I just flash here the signal region efficiency in the signal regions for uh, uh, electrons uh, and muons. Uh, so uh, for, for this analysis, we are doing a simultaneous fit of three signal regions where we fit the BDT score and two control regions where we fit the number of events. Again, we don't see any significant excess over the standard model. And the exclusion limit now is set uh, to 1.48 uh, TV for the electrons 
and one point uh, forty seven TV for the neurons for beta equal one. Here you see the regions that uh, we are fitting, uh, basically, and uh, the limits. And uh, now I'm moving on to another analysis, downtype leptoquarks to uh, top tau, top tau. This is the first dedicated uh, atlas analysis in this final state. Uh, the channel categorization is based on the number of uh, light leptons, electrons, or muons, uh, or number of hadronic taus. Uh, you see here this schematic uh, with different channels. Uh, there are major backgrounds uh, that are channel dependent. Uh, we have uh, TT bar with fake non prompt light leptons or uh, fake taus, uh, TTV, TTH, or diboson. And we have six validation, uh, 17 control, uh, and uh, seven signal regions uh, that we use, uh, which are defined uh, orthogonal to each other. And we fit uh, HT lab uh, or number of events in the control regions and the effective mass in the signal regions. Uh, some take uh, takeaway uh, messages from this analysis is the DNN tau ID that we use, which offers increased uh, increased uh, fake tau rejection at the same efficiency and the kinematic reweighting that we do in an NZ uh, dependent way to correct for the TT bar uh, mismodeling uh, known at high effective mass. And uh, the effective mass is basically the main discriminating variable, which is the sum of uh, PT of all the physics objects uh, plus the missing KT. And here you see how it discriminates well uh, uh, from the total background, uh, total standard model background with using this variable for different leptoquark signals. And this is uh, one of the M effective distributions for uh, uh, the most sensitive uh, region that uh, we use, so one lepton plus at least two taus. And uh, the search range for this analysis is from 0.5 to 1.6 TV. Again, we don't have any significant excess over the standard model. And the limits uh, are set to 1.43 for beta equal one and uh, 1.22 TV for beta equal 0.5, uh, which are the most stringent limits so far on this uh, decay mode. And here you see that uh, we also have limits uh, apart from the combinations of all the channels uh, here. Uh, we have uh, separately for one lepton and two lepton uh, channels, at least two lepton channels. And uh, now I'm flashing just uh, some nicer interpretations that we have from Suzy analysis, including uh, top four bottom squark decays uh, to neutralinos or gravitinos. Uh, for them, you can have further information here uh, from the papers or tomorrow from Abisex uh, talk. Uh, again, we don't have any significant access over uh, the standard model expectation value. And the exclusion limit here uh, as a function of mass and branching fraction is uh, set to uh, 1.24 TV for T new, T new, uh, 1.26 TV for B new, B new, and 1.25 TV for uh, B tau T new or T tau B new. This is the flavor of the diagonal that I was explaining. And here you see uh, in the plots, the gray area uh, is basically the previous limits uh, that we had uh, for that. And uh, now I'm flashing just uh, some uh, uh, already public summary plots from uh, the third generation uh, uh, leptocar combination for 36 inverse femtobar. These results are for uptype and downtype leptoquarks uh, for different processes. And in the searches that I presented today with a full run to data set, uh, the mass exclusion is extended by uh, 250 to 500 GV compared to these uh, plots. So basically, the combinations of what I saw today is expected to further extend uh, the reach that we currently have. And I'm all ready to my summary. So uh, we showed some very exciting and promising results from Leptocarc searches in Atlas with a full run to data set, covering a wide range of phase space and final states and exploring a flavor diagonal and cross-generational models. Uh, there were significant improvement in the sensitivity compared to previous searches, but no significant access uh, was observed uh, over the standard model expectation. Uh, still, although the exclusion limits uh, are pushed to even higher masses, and uh, as a result, we have some of the most stringent limits available so far. And uh, then most of these searches uh, will also be interpreted in the context of vector leptoquarks, uh, where the higher cross-section 
uh, points to higher uh, mass exclusion. Uh, we are also already planning a combination of the left to work results for the full run too. And there are also many new analyses on the way uh, that are not public yet, so stay tuned. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you very much for that talk. Um, are there any questions from anyone? Uh, so while you guys are thinking about it, uh, maybe I'll ask a couple of questions. Uh, one is, uh, uh, I was just wondering, connecting to the previous talk. Uh, so you've shown, uh, you know, you've explored the channel where the uh, lepto quarks are decaying to a top quark and a tau. Uh, is it, uh, are, do you have, uh, have you guys thought about doing it for uh, leptoquarks decaying to a light quark jet uh, and a tau? Uh, because that would connect directly with the uh, EIC searches uh, that was, that were mentioned in the previous uh, talk. Or is that too difficult or? Yeah, but to be, to be sure, I haven't heard about it. So I don't think it's in the plans yet. Uh, I don't know exactly which, uh, which is the difficulty of that now, but uh, yeah, what I can say. Is it just the background from light quark jets, I guess, or I guess with top quarks, top quark jets are, I guess, easier to identify, I'm assuming, or is that why you, is that why you chose to look at the top quark? Yes, yes. Basically for the top quarks, uh, we can just get the B jets. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's uh, basically easier and uh, also some uh, larger jets uh, that are produced. Uh, from that, so we have uh, ways to to do it uh, more sufficiently. Even uh, now, when we do light jets, uh, we don't do we don't include any jet identification mm -hmm. because I mean uh, the for the light uh, for the light jets we have the the let's say more inefficient uh, ID. Right. But that. still, I guess even if you just uh, you know some overall light jets, that that would still contribute some information to the EIC. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and my other uh, question is that uh, uh, you did look at, uh, you know, leptoquarks decaying to light jets and electrons uh, and light jets and muons. Uh, do you guys compare the limits that you get uh, from that to what you get from uh, uh, just from Drellion? Uh, right. Uh, so in, in the, uh, if you look at the Drellion uh, invariant mass of the uh, final leptons that goes through a T-channel process, but I think it will involve the same coupling of leptoquarks, light quark, and uh, say electron or muon. Uh, so I wonder if you guys think about uh, seeing if the, what the correlation is between the limits uh, you get from Drellion versus uh, these uh, you know, lepton, uh, lepto quark pair production processes. Yeah, um, well, I, I, again, I'm not aware, sorry, sorry about it. Yeah, no, uh, no problem, yeah, okay. Yeah, and uh, I think from an exhaustive uh, read that I did uh, to the paper, they don't uh, quote any comparison with this. I see. So yeah, it's just, uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, no problem. I was just trying to connect uh, the last two talks. But, Are there uh, any, yeah, I uh, think it, it was a good uh, observation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are there any other questions from anyone? Uh, all right. If not, uh, I think this uh, brings us to the end of this session. So I want to thank all the speakers again, and I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, and I hope you guys uh, enjoy the rest of the workshop. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.